It's The Real News, I'm Aaron Maté. In 1953, the U.S. and Britain overthrew Iran's democratic government. The reason was oil. Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh had nationalized the country's oil industry, angering Britain and the oil company that today is known as BP. The British partnered with the CIA to oust Mossadegh and install the Shah, who ruled until his overthrow in the Iranian Revolution of 1979. The 1953 coup shaped modern Iranian history, but it's not very well known here in the U.S. The CIA didn't acknowledge its role until 2013, and the U.S. government has refused to release the full internal documents that show what it did. Well, that has just changed. The State Department has just released hundreds of pages of documents, not all of them, that provide new details on the CIA's role in the Iran coup of 1953. And to discuss these documents, I spoke today with someone who's been waiting to read them for a long time. Malcolm Byrne is Deputy Director at the Non-Governmental National Security Archive based at George Washington University. He runs the archive's Iran-U.S. Relations Project. Malcolm, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. So before we get into what these new documents say, I'm wondering if you could set the scene for us uh, in a historical context, talking about what happened in the 1953 coup that the CIA took part in. Well, it's a, a really fascinating historical episode, but it's one with a lot of current political resonance uh, for Iranians, that is. Most Americans have never heard of the coup, uh, and it's ancient history for us. But for the Iranians, uh, the, the situation started in the early 1950s. Uh, in 1951, they nationalized their oil industry, and this was done by uh, their prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh. Uh, this was an event that really sent shockwaves uh, outside the, in the British Empire, uh, which relied on their, their oil uh, facilities in Iran for a lot of uh, income and uh, they reacted violently. Now, the United States, they called upon to help them in this because we were allies, but uh, the Truman administration was really not anxious to get involved in anything military or, or even a covert coup uh, because they were, were trying to get the British and the French and others to, uh, to cut back on their colonial attitude. This is after the war. You know, it's supposed to be the 20th century. We are, are in a different world. Uh, and so the Americans came across at first as kind of heroes, supporters of Iran, and this uh, builds on a, a, a number of years of history of, of helping to get the Russians out of the country and so on. But then in 1953, when uh, President Eisenhower came into office, an entirely different attitude took hold. And uh, the U.S., along with British intelligence, we're talking about the CIA now and British intelligence, uh, got together and worked out a plan to overthrow the same prime minister, Mossadegh, because they couldn't see any other way out of the, uh, the crisis, which they believed, the Americans feared, above all, might lead to some sort of Soviet intervention or Soviet-backed coup uh, inside the country. So that's, uh, that's how the coup came about. And Mossadegh, uh, he was elected democratically, right? Yeah. Now, you know, it's... It's a cloudy, sort of murky story because uh, a lot of years have gone by, and this is such an emotional history. And whenever you have that combination, you've got to be really careful how you define your terms, what sources you use, you know, who you believe, and so on. Uh, but generally speaking, this was a, a country that, that had elections. Uh, there were a lot of times when uh, they were clearly rigged. But uh, the, the general consensus is that Mossadegh uh, had originally been elected democratically. And his move to nationalize the oil industry in 1951 had uh, wide support, um, if I'm not mistaken. Inside Iran, Inside Iran definitely. <laughs> not by the British. The British uh, were, were, you know, fit to be tied, and, and the Iranians had to take the case to the international court to try to adjudicate it. What happened there? Uh, they won. Um, so the British were, were kind of pushed back, and, and that's part of what led them to think in terms of a coup d'etat or a military strike of some kind. 
Okay, so the British enlist uh, the U.S. for this operation, and the CIA gets involved uh, under, uh, the code name is Operation Ajax. Um, right. What happens there? Well, it takes a long time to plan this thing. The British had come originally uh, uh, during the Truman period to try to propose this, but uh, the Truman people said, no, we're not really interested. Uh, you know, you better wait till the next group comes in, because the main interaction was right after the election and Eisenhower had just been elected. So it even took a little bit of time for Eisenhower to come around, but uh, by you know springtime 53, a couple months after he'd taken office, uh, he and his top advisors had pretty much come to the conclusion that they, they wanted to move in. They, they were uh, afraid above all of Soviet intervention or Soviet uh, advantage of some kind. The British mainly wanted their oil, wanted the revenues from it and so on. Uh, but they, they had a meeting of the minds in terms of their agreement to get rid of Mossadegh. So they put together a plan jointly. They get the approval of uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill and President Eisenhower, and that's in uh, July of 1953. And then by uh, the middle of August, the, the coup gets underway. Okay, and so these new documents that have come out from the CIA, uh, close to 1,000 pages, reveal some new details uh, of the CIA's involvement. Can you uh, lay out for us the major disclosures that you've seen so far? Sure. I haven't gone through the whole volume yet, but it's, it's fascinating. And I, you know, I want to say that it, it's maybe more interesting for historians than for uh, people who are just coming to the issue for the first time, because it, it fills in a lot of details. It gives you a lot of, of different perspectives, American uh, perspectives, but you know, different agency perspectives, the CIA versus the State Department versus the White House and so on. Um, and it fleshes out the story a lot. If, if I can take just one second, it's important to sort of figure out and understand how we came to know what we know about the coup up to this point, you know, up to last week when this volume was put out. Um, the very first story about the coup came out just a year afterwards in 1954 in a magazine called the Saturday Evening Post. So clearly somebody at CIA uh, decided that they were going to leak this story and they put a lot of detail into that article. But officially, CIA and the British uh, refused to discuss it, refused to acknowledge their role for decades. In the late 1970s, the main uh, sort of, you know, the leader of the coup on the ground in Iran uh, a guy with a familiar name, Kermit Roosevelt. He was a relative of, of the two presidents. And he, he was, was the son of Theodore Roosevelt, right? He was grandson of Theodore. Okay. And the cousin of, of Franklin. And uh, a, a sort of, you know, an adventurer and someone who thought about all this as, as the great game, which was the old expression that they used to use. So he was put in charge of this operation. And uh, a couple of decades later, he decided he wanted to write about it. And so he did publish a book, and there's an interesting story about how that got past CIA censors, but it made it out. And uh, it also gave a lot of detail about what was happening. The problem is, with as with any memoir, it's, it's all about the author. And so it's come under some criticism for being not exactly balanced. It puts Kermit, you know, in center stage. Um, in at other times, other people have written books who were involved, some British agents, for instance. So we got some ideas there. Uh, but it's all bits and pieces. Then in the year 2000, the New York Times got a leak of an internal document, a 200-page CIA history, still classified, that they wrote a giant article about, I think two articles. And then, uh, this being a relatively early age of the Internet, they did a great thing. They posted the document on the web. And they took out some names and things like that, which is fine, but uh, there, there the document was. And in fact, we have it on our website now at the National Security Archive. And that pr produced a ton of information about the specifics of the coup. Who did what, you know, what time of day on August 18th, uh, so-and-so met with so-and-so, that kind of thing. Um, we also have interviews from some of the operatives. I've done some of those interviews and my colleague, Mark Gazirowski at Tulane University is, is sort of the leader on this. So from all of these different vantage points, we've gotten bits and pieces. Uh, then in 1989, the State Department put out a volume of documents, just like the one that came out last week, with one huge problem. It did not say one word about 
CIA or British involvement in the coup. It just portrayed it as, gee whiz, there's this spontaneous uprising that has happened in favor of the Shah. Isn't it amazing? Uh, and that caused outrage in the historical community, and it led to resignations of people involved and so on, because it was just a whitewash of, of the history. And those portions and were redacted? Just left out entirely. Just omitted, it, okay. It, it had never happened. It was just, you know, you get a report from the embassy, uh, from the ambassador, the day of the coup, going, the, the amazing events are happening, unfolding before our eyes on the streets of Tehran. You know, the spontaneous support for the Shah. Well, it's just nonsense. Um, so the department, to their credit, decided that they would produce a new volume that would correct that, that historical, uh, you know, falsehood. And uh, it took a long time. It's been 20, you know, over 25 years, but they finally came out with it uh, last week. And so now we have, and this is a long way to get to this point, but we now have in, in a thousand more pages, which is a lot of material, uh, a lot more perspective on different parts of the CIA, what they were thinking and doing, how they reacted, uh, parts of the State Department, and of course they're reporting on other people's reactions and so on. So it's a, it's a, you know, a Rashomon effect where you, you now get uh, a lot of perspective that was not available before, and it, it is, there's still some material that hasn't been released, but uh, there's a lot of great stuff here for people to, to sort of mix and match and, and compare notes with what we've known before. Okay, and so one of the things we've known before uh, is that Kermit Roosevelt, who you mentioned, that he uh, ignored orders uh, to abort the coup because apparently it wasn't going well. But these new right. documents give detail on exactly uh, how he went about being insubordinate and proceeding with the coup anyway. Right. And we, again, we knew some of this before, and some of the interviews that people have done, I did an interview with a a guy who was one of the operatives, it, it was in fact his first posting overseas with the CIA, so he was a 20-something kid, you know, uh, getting his feet wet for the first time, and he uh, tells a story of being in the room with Kermit when this cable came in from CIA headquarters saying, drop everything, this has gone to hell in a handbasket, get your troops together and get out of town. And according to this, uh, this witness, Roosevelt crumpled up the cable and threw it in the trash can and said, we never saw that. And off they went to uh, try to recoup every, uh, the, what had uh, you know, been a disaster up to that point. So in this new volume, what we have is, is the actual cable that was sent that says pretty much the same thing. It's you know, based on reporting we're getting, this is, this is going nowhere fast and it's going to be a real problem, so you guys should, should get out of there. Uh, and we also have some after action meetings uh, you know, minutes of meetings where Roosevelt is now meeting with all of his superiors were the ones who said, you got to wrap this up. And he's now got to explain himself and say, you know, why did I make that call on my own? And, uh, and a, a damn good thing it worked out. And Roosevelt proceeds with a plan that uh, involves uh, rented crowds of people, right? Right. Can you explain that? Yeah, well, this is a, a big aspect of Iranian politics. Anybody who's who's been around the last, you know, 30 years or so uh, will be familiar with the, with televised scenes of huge crowds in Iran, whether it's when the Ayatollah Khomeini you know, returns to the country after exile or uh, things of that sort. And crowds are, you know, are a key element uh, going back decades in Iranian politics. Uh, things are, are just generally unstable enough that if you, you get enough people out there, you can you can really change things around. So that was always a key part of the plan was, uh, you know, there were several aspects to it, but one of the keys was get these crowds out there any way you can and, uh, and make it look like uh, the Shah has everybody's support and we hope we'll carry the day. And the Shah is who the U.S. installed until he was uh, forced out uh, in 1979. Um, in terms of uh, the consequences of this, uh, first of all, is it safe to say that actually if this was about oil, then Western goals failed because the nationalist sentiment of Mossadegh was so strong that in the end, even with the Shah in power, uh, the uh, Western oil companies, like British Petroleum especially, were forced to still share the oil profits with Iran? Yeah, I think if you get a little more specific, if, you, if you're talking just about the British, I think they got 
they got sort of the short end of the stick. And not that I'm sad about that, but you know, they they uh, came into this with this conception of privilege and ownership that belongs in that era of, uh, of colonialism and neo-colonialism. They just had, had no qualms about uh, demanding their rights and uh, and minimizing and vilifying and diminishing the the role, the capabilities, uh, and every other aspect of, of the Iranians who they resented like hell for for taking their uh, their resource. The Americans, I think, had a different attitude, and there is disagreement about this. There are others who who think that this was all about oil. I think it depends on how you define. Uh, the the priority with oil was oil considered a commercial uh, commodity that uh, you know private companies were going to make a lot of money off of, or was it more important as a strategic uh, component of the calculation of the Cold War? And my view, based on all the documents that I've read, uh, is that the people like Truman and even Eisenhower, they really were more interested in in the strategic component because for them. Uh, job one was to keep the Russians out. If the Russians got access to the oil, that would be a, a, a really terrible thing because uh, we're still talking about not being that many years out of World War II. And Western Europe is still rebuilding and Japan is still rebuilding and they need uh, natural resources. They need oil. And uh, if they don't get access to it, then that could lead to really serious political problems and, and leave an opening for the Russians politically, you know, propaganda wise and ideologically to and, and their proxies to come in and and, uh, and gain some real influence. So I believe that it's from that point of view that they, the American side was worried about oil. Were the American companies concerned about commercial sides? Of course they were. And it's very hard sometimes to separate the commercial and the and the political in U.S. foreign policy. But in this case, I think that policymakers wanted to make sure that the Russians didn't get it. That was what their concern was. Yeah, and I'm sure it wasn't just about the Russians. I mean, the fact is, if you control oil or you control access to oil, then that gives you huge leverage over geopolitics around the globe. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's end then with the implications today. Um, we should point out that this was not a, uh, a, a widely trumpeted release. Uh, announcing the release of these documents, which has been a big deal, for a long time, was uh, right. announced very quietly. It was appended to a, a, a sort of a, a release about 16 other releases, if I'm not mistaken. Um, exactly right. So if you could talk about the significance of this coming out now in the context of a, of a Trump administration that has been very confrontational towards Iran. Uh, recently, Rex Tillerson talked about how the Trump administration supports a peaceful transition of government inside Iran, effectively soft regime change. Um, and uh, how especially documents like these might be received in Iran today, which has right. been heavily influenced by this history and the memories of that coup over 60 years ago still loom large. Right. So there are no you know, solid facts uh, here, alternative or otherwise, that, that can confirm this. But just from the, the way this has played out, uh, there clearly seems to be a, some sort of a political or policy component to it. Because, as you said, for decades this stuff has been kept secret, and usually it's been for reasons of, of sort of spycraft. You know, the, the CIA doesn't want uh, its secrets about uh, sources and methods to come out. It doesn't matter if this thing happened 60 years ago. The British are even worse on this on this subject. More recently, uh, and specifically since the 2015 Iran nuclear deal that was signed with the P5 plus one countries, um, the, the State Department under Obama and John Kerry has been very reluctant to do anything to sort of stir the political waters in Iran. And they have specifically have said in the context of uh, meetings of, of State Department historians that are, that are public sessions that, uh, that they don't want to do anything that might create problems or give the hardliners uh, in Iran the opportunity to make mischief. Uh, now, all of a sudden, you have a change of regime in the United States, and uh, within, a, according to information that I have, within a, about a two-month period, the decision gets made by the Rex Tillerson State Department to release this, this stuff. And the, it just, you can't help but come to the reaction that, you know, this, this attitude is something like, 
well, if Kerry's State Department wanted it this way, we're going to do it the other way. And th they've given plenty of, of uh, indication that they, they being the Trump administration and Tillerson as well, that they don't put much stock in this nuclear deal at all. So it's not hard to imagine that they would not shed tears if, if uh, something like this came out and, and caused problems for it. My first uh, reaction and sense is that it's not going to cause big problems, and I hope it doesn't, frankly. Uh, they've got other things in Iran that they're focusing on right now. But, uh, but it's hard to imagine that, that something like this wasn't at play. You know, Malcolm, I want to say one thing about uh, the issue of um, Obama and Kerry and their view on this. I, I take your point about them not wanting to stir the pot. But could it also be said that, you know, they could have taken the opportunity to apologize for overthrowing a country's sovereign government. Obama and the CIA did acknowledge it uh, when Obama was president. But he had the opportunity to apologize, and he made a conscious decision not to. Well, you know, it's not surprising, and maybe it's in retrospect that I say that. Uh, Clinton mentioned it. Uh, Madeleine Albright, his Secretary of State, came very close to apologizing, as close as she could. Obama, like you say, had uh, made specific mention of it. Um, the problem that they're facing, and I'm not saying I advocate the, the stand that they took, but I believe that what they were looking at was a hostile domestic uh, set of opponents. And uh, one of the things that is, is like a, you know, the proverbial uh, red flag in front of a bull is for a Democratic president or Secretary of State to apologize for anything that the United States did. Republicans would have made mincemeat out of them uh, for doing that. And that's my sense is that they didn't want to open themselves up to that kind of attack that would just destroy what they were trying to achieve in the first place. I understand, but it's, uh, it still raises questions about what could have been done earlier on. Uh, but certainly... I, I, I'm with you on that on all kinds of fronts. When you look at these documents just from a, a classification standpoint, I, you know, I defy you to find anything in them that would justify their being withheld for so long. And I also agree, that's my own personal opinion on the policy front, I don't see a problem in acknowledging what you did and, uh, you know, getting it out of the way and saying, look, we, that was a different time and place, and that's what the attitudes of these people were. It's not my attitude, but uh, we have to understand and, and accept it. And we understand it's caused, uh, you know, real problems. Uh, it, it's good to get the, the myths out of the way so you have a clearer sense on both sides. But you know, let's get this over with and, and move on to, uh, uh, to something more, more positive and fruitful. Well, Malcolm, on that note of contrition, I want to apologize to you for keeping you way longer than we agreed to, and uh, I appreciate oh. your extra time on this. Malcolm I Byrne, Deputy Director at the Non-Governmental National Security Archive, based at George Washington University. He runs the Archive's Iran-U.S. Relations Project. Malcolm, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News. Thank you.